Welcome. Welcome to Kidney Conversations with Remend. Um, my name is Kiku Boyens. I'm the Executive Director for Remend, a nonprofit organization dedicated to assisting people with kidney disease. We're a group of nonprofit uh, we're a group of volunteers, everyday people, who have either already successfully experienced dialysis, presently undergoing dialysis, or have received a transplant. Remen provides peer-to-peer -peer mentorship, guidance, and emotional support. Our goal is to encourage and empower those people who are on their kidney journey. You can learn more about Remend by visiting our website at remend.org. So we're getting back to kidney basics today. Uh, most people are, bo are born with two healthy functional kidneys. Most individuals don't even think about their kidneys on a daily basis, but those two small bean-shaped organs are vital for those with kidney disease or who have had a transplant. Besides acting as a filtration system, your kidneys play a role in bone and heart health. So what happens when they start to fall short of performing these important tasks? Today, we'll discuss how do kidneys work? How do you know when they aren't working? How does dialysis work? Can chronic kidney disease progression be prevented? But first, I'm gonna do a little housekeeping. Uh, we wanna hear from you, so please send us your questions in the chat box. We'll answer questions throughout the broadcast and at the end if we've missed any. We also have a short survey you can complete anonymously, which is very much appreciated if you do that. So let's begin. I want to say I have the wrong slides here, so I think things are out of order, so I apologize for that. But I'd like to introduce our panelists. Uh, let me see here. Okay. Panelists, start video here. There's Bridget. Hello. Big welcome to our panelists today. Um, you're seeing Bridget Lubers. She's a mentor, Remen mentor and patient advocate. We also have Charmaine Griffith also a Remen mentor and patient advocate. Paul Dinich, he just signed on. This is his first uh, Remen uh, Kidney Conversation. So welcome, Paul. He's also a mentor and patient advocate. Hi, everybody. Hooray, Hello. Look at Paul. Hey, Paul. Hey. <laughs> welcome, welcome. <laughs> I'm on my phone. Uh, the computer wasn't working, so you may have a zoomed in picture of me. That's OK. okay you see. look great. Hey. You look great. <laughs> And then we also have Cindy Polis. Um, she's the Care Coordination Management Education Nurse for Balboa United. She's been with them for 20, uh, since 2020, and she works with chronic kidney disease patients to help optimize a healthier lifestyle and educate patients on different uh, modality options for dialysis. She supports uh, Balboa Nephrology Clinics covering San Diego County. We also have Dr. Amir Patel, nephrologist. I hope I said your name right. Dr. Patel is a nephrologist with Balboa Nephrology Medical Group since 2019. He practices in the South Bay, Chula Vista area, specializing in kidney diseases, including electrolyte imbalance, hypertension, and dialysis. So welcome, everyone. Before we jump into things, I want to, while I have this screen up, I want to show you one more thing. I have a few kidney facts that we're going to be discussing. Um, <clears throat> 37 million American adults have CKD, chronic kidney disease, and millions of others are at increased risk. Approximately uh, one in three adults with diabetes and one in five adults with high blood pressure may have kidney disease. And over 2 million people worldwide currently receive treatment with dialysis or a kidney transplant. So we're gonna be talking about all those things, pretty mind blowing facts there. So. I wanna make sure I can see everyone here. There's Dr. Patel. I'm gonna ask you a few things today. Great. So Dr. Patel, what, what do the kidneys do for the body? Could, let's, we're gonna be very basic here. So how do they work and, and what's the kidneys process? Sure, so I, you know, the way I like to explain to my patients when I see them is um, what goes into the body must come out. And, and we can think about everything as food is what we, what comes in and what comes out is generally our urine, our feces and sweating. Um, and what the kidneys do is really regulate everything in between that um, from electrolytes, sodium, potassium, your acid levels, and really metabolizing waste product that the body develops uh, just with the natural live and die process of all the cells, as well as the toxins that we take in. 
Um, everything we consume gets broken down in some form in an, of, or another. And the kidney's job is to filter the blood and create urine to remove waste product. Um, and so kind of the general principle of what's coming in and what comes out. And if there's an imbalance, then you can have some disease state. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, you know, while we're getting into this, I wanted to ask you, Dr. Patel, why did you decide to specialize in nephrology? Great question. I don't get that uh, asked that enough. Um, I, I started my med medicine journey just basically wanting to help friends and family guide them and not necessarily treat them, but just guide them to the right direction of, hey, you have this ailment, you should do this. Um, and that's basically internal medicine or family practice. And nephrology is um, a subspecialty of internal medicine. And what I love about nephrology, what drew me into it was you retain all of the knowledge that you develop from day one. And the more of that knowledge you keep and retain, the potentially better nephrologist you'll be. Um, that was one aspect. And then the second aspect was I see patients in all clinical settings um, in the hospital where they're very sick. I see patients that are in my office where not all the time we talk about medicine, but we kind of talk about um, the, the background of Bridget um, over there where they go on vacation. And so we get to learn and have long lasting relationships. So it, it really is um, a field that keeps me on my toes in terms of the medicine, as well as the acute and chronic nature. And then as we, um, as some of us know, I see patients in the dialysis units and that's a different sort of um, kind of um, area where, you know, it's it just really variable in anything we do. Mm -hmm. so. I, I'd love to talk about dialysis in a, in a little bit too. So that's, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Cindy, I also wanted to ask you the same question. Why did you decide to specialize in, in nephrology? Um, I knew getting into nephrology would be kind of a complicated arena of care. So I thought if I could really specialize and become that um, educated nurse in one specific area, the kidneys, I felt like I could really be a good advocate and a good teacher and a good mentor for all those patients suffering with hypertension, diabetes, and really educate on that prevention side and also getting them prepared and understanding the expectations. I, I love to teach. I love patient care. I love the science behind kidney disease. Um, so I thought all of those together would be a good package and a good opportunity to empower my patients. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. And, you know, I would like to maybe share a little bit of your story, Bridget, and how you became to be a part of Remend and just, you know, what patient advocacy means to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I've been a kidney disease patient, I guess, um, for over 22 years. Uh, I've had a couple of kidney transplants along the way. And I have been on dialysis since 2006. So I've kind of like been through the ringer with all the different things. I've been on PD, I've done in center, you know, I've had the transplants, I've had different treatments and stuff. And so, um, you know, I've gone through a lot with it. And I find that my accidental expertise in this arena um, can it really help other people? You know, it's something mm -hmm. I never expected to be able to do with my time. But now, um, because I have learned that I need to focus almost exclusively on my health to keep me feeling good and healthy, that uh, I use the time and the experience that I have um, to really connect with other patients, especially folks who are new to kidney disease. Um, it's very scary. People don't know what to expect. They hear a lot of negative things, especially about how long you can survive on dialysis. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I like to use my experience telling people 10 years is not the max. You can take care of yourself, be a good patient. Right. And, um, you know, a positive attitude helps. Yeah, so, definitely. Yeah, you, you definitely have that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. We love having you. I, I would like to um, talk to Paul. Hey, how's it going, Paul? 
I haven't seen you in a couple of years. Yes, <laughs> it's been a long time. <laughs> it's been a long time. Thanks for joining us today. I'm wondering if you'd be able to share a little bit about your kidney journey. Right. So, so mine started with lupus back uh, when I was in high school. And, you know, slowly but surely, it just started uh, degrading the kidney. Um, and then uh, about after, after the high school, after the, the college time period, um, that's when the kidney function started to drop. Mm. And so I started going to Babola nephrology and, and seeing a, a, you know, a specialist. Um, and in 2011, I went on dialysis. So in center dialysis mm -hmm. would go, uh, I, I think it was, it was four hours, three times, three times a week. Yep. And I was, I was very fortunate. I, you know, I had a good experience with dialysis. Uh, I was only on there for nine months before we were able to, we were able to stabilize my condition and find a donor. So oh, wow. very, very lucky there. Uh, my donor happened to be uh, the, the wife of my cousin. So it was, it was very nice. Right on. And so I, I received my transplant in 2012. Mm -hmm. And so September of this year will be my 10th year. Uh, with, with Yay, Yay. Right on. Oh my gosh. That's great. That's so right great. on. And you have some, um, some little ones at home now too, right? Since we've known each other, I think you've had. A yeah. So I have, we have two, we have two, yeah. we have a, a, a three and a half and a two and a half year old. Oh, that's great, Paul. So sweet. And we Congratulations. just, this is our, our first week starting preschool. So we're, we're, going, oh. we're going through those battles. Well, good luck with that. Yep. <laughs> and Charmaine, do you want to touch uh, a little bit on, on what Remand means to you? Yeah, yeah. I, I um, came across Remand in uh, 2014 and I was um, transplanted out about 11 years at that time. And I transplanted in 2003, my second one. And um, I actually came, it was the social worker. I was having an appointment with my nephrologist and um, I was chatting with, it wasn't my social worker at the time when I was dialyzing at the clinic, but, um, but the other social worker there and he and I were just connecting and he just handed me the flyer or the pamphlet, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so I just, I was so excited because it was something that I had been wanting to do for a long time. And I was trying to figure out a way to, you know, there had to be some place that, that offered something to allow people to give back. And at that time, I think Boyne Creek was having these little um, like education classes or something like that, but they weren't really structured or a specific time and all that schedule. So anyway, so yeah, I, I emailed um, Dennis Bork at the time and, uh, and I was just, you know, I mean, we met and it's just, you know, it just took off from there. So Remen mm -hmm. is just an amazing, um, it's been an amazing experience for me just to be able to, as Bridget was saying, and that, you know, just to give back and share our experiences, um, to just give people hope, you know, that, mm -hmm. that it's okay that you can, you know, do, you know, I mean, I, I still tried to live a very normal life when I was on dialysis as hard as it was, um, but I still try to, you know, just force myself to get up and get going and try to have those experiences, just those life experiences. Um, mm -hmm. And so I just like to be able to share that with other people. Yeah. That they can do. Right on. Thank you. You're and welcome. I'm a patient too. I'm um, like Paul, I, I had a good experience. Um, you know, I was on peritoneal dialysis and in center for a little while. I was transplanted after four and a half years of dialysis and October 9th will be my 20th year. So, whew. It's been a long road, but I feel great. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for sharing. And now let's get into some, some details here. Dr. Patel is the star of our okay. show today. Um, <laughs> so what are the major causes of kidney disease in adults? Yeah, so in adults, uh, there's really two major causes, um, hypertension and diabetes. They take up a large percentage of the issues dealing with the kidney, and generally they are a chronic disease that kind of impacts the kidney over time. Um, but as some of our uh, mentors here, they've had different experiences with what we would call glomerular nephritis, which is a long word that really means inflammation in one part of the kidney that does the filtering, the glomerulus. And um, for example, lupus or whatever else, other ailments, that causes um, also kidney failure in adults as well as children, but primarily I'm an adult nephrologist. And 
Um, those are a smaller percentage, but in the two main causes are high blood pressure and diabetes. Mm -hmm. And is it true, I mean, so many people that I speak with coming into Remen say they had no idea they had kidney disease and it's been tagged, you know, a silent killer. Um, you know, what can we do to, like, what are some of the symptoms um, of kidney disease? Yeah, and so that's a great point, and, I, and that's what I love about Remend, um, because you guys are helping just get the word out. Um, when you say silent killer, people don't know what that really means until they're in the stage of, wow, I have symptoms. And so with kidney disease, um, as, as our body is a miraculous, um, really, machine on the planet, it, it takes a tipping point, and, and that tipping point is different for everyone, but Generally speaking, um, when your kidney function gets down to about 15, 20% or even 10% of function is when you may find symptoms. And, and so when I talked about the in, in and out intake and output, um, that's where you see the imbalance. And so it could be something like um, not the toxins build up in the blood causing nausea, vomiting, lack of appetite, generalized fatigue, which can be related to some of the other things the kidneys do in terms of maintaining a hemoglobin or becoming anemic. Um, people have sleep reversal. They, they sleep during the day instead of at night and people don't know why. And because it happens slowly over time, all of these nonspecific symptoms, meaning anything can really cause nausea or vomiting. If you eat too much candy, you can get nausea or vomiting, but you could also have nausea or vomiting from renal failure. And so, um, as kidney disease progresses, these symptoms may come up. And because our body is a great machine, we adapt and our bodies adapt. And because it happens slowly, we don't recognize it until that tipping point of, you know what, it's been months and I need to go to the hospital or I need to see my doctor. And so when I say I love Remed, I really mean it because you are the ones telling the world that you should see a physician sooner. You should get your blood checked. You should get your blood pressure checked. Um, these are the things that, you know, I talked about high blood pressure and diabetes. Those are both also silent killers. So now we're talking about two silent killers that cause a silent killing disease. Mm -hmm. And so it's really about getting the, the information out there to the public. And it starts with Rima. Yeah, I, I want to, yeah, thank you. I just, I wanted to, if I could just, just kind of piggyback off of what Kiku said that talking to patients and, you know, one of the, or clients, um, one of the um, questions that, that I ask just in general conversation is just about, you know, like, like what caused their kidney failure just to see if there was some commonality and things like that. And, and a lot of times they just, they don't know, mm -hmm. you know like, I, I don't know, but then, you know, kind of digging de deeper and asking them like, well, what other ailments do you have? And then they're, it's usually diabetes or high blood pressure. And so I just wanted to mention that I, I find it just interesting that they don't link those, you know, mm -hmm. when those are the two, primarily the, the two main causes of kidney failure, you know, mm -hmm. and, and people just don't link all those together. Mm -hmm. I come across that a lot in the clinic as well, uh, when new patients are getting started on dialysis, you know, and I can overhear nurses, doctors talking with them, oh, what caused your dialysis, you know, like, why are you on dialysis? Mm -hmm. I don't know. My kidney stopped working. I don't know why, mm -hmm. you know, and it is the same kind of thing where it ends up being they're diabetic or they have a blood pressure issue or some combination of those two things. But it's very often they're just like, I don't know, the doctor said my kidneys aren't working. I need to start this now. I'm not really sure what's going on. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, when, when I started dialysis or was diagnosed with kidney disease, I had no idea that it was because of my blood pressure. And, and because I had a disease, I was diagnosed with something at 18 with Wegener's granulomatosis. And I didn't know that would somehow, you know, end up with, I'd have kidney disease because of that. So I'm so happy that we do have Remend and there are other programs too, as long as people are getting education about yeah. kidney disease and, and, you know, while they can still do something about it, um, diet is a huge question that people, you know, ask me about, um, you know, so we're just doing our little thing, but I hope that people get information about kidney disease, kidney failure where they can, because it's, it's so important because things can be, um, you know, you can take better care of yourself and kind of keep your kidney levels at, you know, 
um, a healthy rate, right, Dr. Patel? Yeah, absolutely. And, and one thing I want to mention is you don't have to go into a physician's office to say, do I have kidney problems? Um, because we talk about these other diseases that affect the kidneys and really everything affects the kidneys. Because as I said, in whatever you put in the body has to come out and something is processing it, whether it's the liver, whether it's the kidney, but um, you know, there's a lot of different things that can cause harm to the kidney. So getting to see a physician, getting a blood pressure check, getting that basic metabolic panel, which is really the kidney handles all of those functions, um, really puts a lot of things in perspective for the physician you're seeing to say, hey, wait a minute, we need you to see a nephrologist, or you don't need to see a nephrologist, but your blood pressure is high, and we need to make, take control of that, because the earlier you see that, and I'm talking early as I'm, I'm 18, and I don't need to see a pediatrician, and I'm going to see an adult um, clinician, that's, that's not early enough, right? I mean, I mean, that's early enough, but that is the time. I mean, some of you are describing uh, at an earlier age, you having problems. And so um, getting the word out is not only about kidney disease, but it's really just about being in tune with what can be happening in the body that you don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was 17 in high school as well. Mm -hmm. uh, when I started noticing I had swollen ankles, that was mm -hmm. my number one thing. And I went to my pediatrician and they did a urinalysis and said, you have protein spilling, go see a kidney doctor. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand any of that. I was like, oh, okay, whatever. I'll take some medicine. Like things will be fine. And yeah. Mm. Fine. Yeah. Bridget, that's how, that's how mine was. I, my ankle yeah. started to swell up. Yeah. You know, and then my, my pediatrician at the time <laughs> didn't really know initially. Yeah. And it, it took like a three or four rounds. And finally, it sounded like by like a stroke of luck, she found that it was lupus. Crazy. And yeah. then, you know, went from there. Uh, yeah. yeah. And it's just one of those being in tune with your body and noticing something is off mm -hmm. here. Like this isn't normal. I should just go to my doctor and just get this checked out. Like, Hey doctor, my ankles are swollen. Mm -hmm. Right. And right. then, you know, that will lead you on a whole path, but that's the best thing to do is like, right. you know, like you really need to just be in tune with your body. If you're feeling funny, something's yep. going on. Say something. Yeah. Exactly. It's, it's something. hard though, because you, you never would expect that it's a ser something serious is happening to you. Exactly. Right. Especially yeah. at it's, a young age like that. Like, yeah. You like, oh, maybe I ate too much pizza or exactly. you know, like, like, maybe like, right. you did that. And I was like, no, it's been like a couple weeks now. Like something is weird. Something's happening. Right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Dr. Patel, how, how is kidney function measured? So kidney function is measured. Um, there's, there's the cumbersome way, uh, which is collecting your urine for 24 hours, which we often don't do unless we feel as clinicians, it will help guide treatment or kind of further diagnose, but primarily it's by blood work and with mm -hmm. routine blood work that any physician, not even, not just a kidney specialist, but any physician can order. Um, there's something in the blood work called creatinine and creatinine is a marker in the blood um, that's produced by muscle and filtered by the kidney and excreted. And so when there is um, creatinine that is higher, that actually correlates to a lower kidney function. Um, and that number essentially gets formulated in the, uh, sorry, gets plugged into a formula that uses age, sex, and race, um, as well as, you know, some other things to spit out a number. And we use that number as a percentage. And that is called the estimated glomerular filtration rate. Um, so it's estimated because we're taking it from a marker in the blood um, and it's using a formula. So that's the shorthand version or um, the estimation, the mm -hmm. actual cumbersome way of collecting urine for 24 hours would give you the true function. Um, and so it's very closely related. And um, with that, we are able to tell patients or to describe, hey, you have kidney disease or you don't. Um, and that's kind of what we do. Mm -hmm. I Nowadays, I hear people talking about, they know what GFR is. I didn't know what that was right. back in the I, day. I'm like, what? It, how do, how do you know either. that? So thank you for no explaining. Idea. I can't say it, glomerular filter, filtration <laughs> rate. <laughs> And if you are changing locations or anything and you happen to have some chronic kidney disease, 
hopefully we're helping people educate them to know why they may have it. But Mm -hmm. knowing that GFR is very helpful for any physician, um, including Mm -hmm. the nephrologist, if you, because I've, I've seen patients that have moved from wherever it is, and I'm now seeing them in, you know, Chula Vista. And, and I ask them, have you ever been told about kidney disease? And some of them say, yeah, like three years ago. And I say, well, do you know what, what it was? And they say, no, but I know they told me something about 35%. Now that, that just one Mm. number of information, even though it may have been three years ago, puts a lot of story behind what I'm going to find out in my interview. And Mm -hmm. so it is very important to know. And it's one of the ways as advocates here and as um, educators and mentors, we can help, help, help everyone help each other take care of themselves. How, um, How could kidney disease affect your overall health? And I think, Charmaine, you have a really good question along with this too, but I want to ask that of you first, Dr. Patel. Yeah, so I mean, again, kidney disease really, as as the silent killer, may not affect you at all until it gets to a level where it's low enough. Um, You know, there's the filtering capacity, so the ability to remove toxins, and then there's the actual getting rid of liquid Um, Mm -hmm. part. And so some people have both. Some people have one of those problems. Um, A lot of people have both of them. And really what it comes down to is overall health. If your kidney function declines, blood pressure can go up. You can start getting headaches. You can have vision changes. You can talk about, you can have that swelling in the legs. Um, You can have generalized fatigue um, Mm. because your body is just working extra hard to keep up with the demands of everyday living. Mm -hmm. Um, people feel lower appetite because of those toxins. I mean, you know, when your body is filled with toxins because your kidneys cannot excrete those toxins, it's almost like you're having a weighted blanket on every aspect of your, of your Mm -hmm. body. So Mm -hmm. think about everything you do. And it's just like, you have to do it with extra weight. So even getting up and going down the stairs or whatever it is, becomes more difficult. And it's because the kidneys do so much to regulate acid levels Mm -hmm. and electrolyte levels and everything of that nature. What an amazing analogy. Yeah. Yeah. That was great. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. so um, the question that I had is, is, uh, and this, I mean, your whole analogy probably kind of answered it, but, but um, I had read an article uh, many, many years ago, um, Gosh, I was very young, but anyway, I just I just remember it stating that kidney failure impacts every part of the body except the inner ear. So, do you do you, would you agree with that, or do you think that that might be um, like what are your thoughts on that? Uh, so, I think um, directly affecting. It, I mean, that's a great question, and and um, it's a difficult question to answer. But I'm going to yeah. take a stab at it and because I'm a kidney doctor and I see patients and, and I see patients from all spectrum of disease, I see, I see patients that have no kidney trouble, but I'm managing their blood pressure because it's too difficult for their primary care doctor to see. And then I see patients that are struggling on dialysis or renal replacement therapy. It affects everything. There's, there's not, I, I would, I would say, does it directly affect the inner ear? Well, you, you know, describing the inner ear is three bones that are connected and maybe <laughs> not, there's not a lot yeah. of, blood but yeah. does it affect your hearing? Yes, absolutely. I think it, it affects your, your, your conscious state. And so yeah. what people are saying to you, hearing is one part of communication it's reception and then processing and then speaking back and if you whether it's directly actually hearing it Mm -hmm. um that's affected or not but the processing part is there so i would say yeah it does affect it affect it i remember um when i when my first transplant failed and i went back on dialysis and I was working for a major communications company there in San Diego. I won't give them a free plug, but, um, but anyway, it was, it was, a, they were a really great employer. And I didn't realize that the first time that my native kidneys failed, I didn't have, I really wasn't very symptomatic at all. But then when the transplanted kidney failed, I was very symptomatic. And I remember one time I was, um, I was working in, <laughs> 
in tech support. That's just funny to me because I'm just not a techie person at all. <laughs> but, uh, but, but I was working in tech support and, you know, we would, you know, we would take calls from, uh, from representatives or whatever that needed help. And so anyway, so my, my manager had, had called, called me, you know, in for a meeting and he's just like, you know, he's like, I'm listening to your call. He's like, you're giving them wrong information. You know, it's like, because I was just so confused that, that I, I did, I thought that I was like um, verbalizing the correct information. I even had it written down and all these little cheat sheets and all that stuff, but there was just something that was disconnected, like brain fog or something like that. Mm. Um, and so mm -hmm. he was just like, yeah, he's just like, you need to stop talking to the <laughs> Oh man. <laughs> I just gave them wrong information. Yeah. So, but anyway, I, poor Charmaine. <laughs> when I was initially going through uh, kidney failure with my native kidneys, I remember I would go to my nephrologist and I would just, you know, mention like I get cold really often or this mm. was always just some random little thing that was a little bit different. And he was like, oh yes, it's because your kidneys do this. Oh yes, it's because they do this. And it was mm -hmm. just through time that I learned, I was like, oh wow. So they like, it's way more than just pee. <laughs> like that's what people yeah do. yeah like, isn't that amazing that they, they do so many things and that so many things yeah and so even you know with being on dialysis I notice each year because it's just been so long my brain fog gets worse and worse I will have like half a conversation with somebody like just they look at me like I'm a crazy person like what are you even talking about and I'm like it all makes sense up here but mm -hmm. it gets right, right. Of trying to come out <laughs> yep. and the fog yep. of trying to think of right. words and focus on different stuff. And when I sleep, when I can sleep, it's like I'm sweating and then I'm freezing cold. Right. And just well, that's so interesting. Things are oh, Dr. Patel, you already answered it. I was just was gonna I, say I, was, I didn't know. I saw it there and I was, I was just going to say, look at him. He is on it. <laughs> Love it. Well, well we I was a just question. thinking about him and thinking, oh, he has a question, but we're, I don't know if we were getting to it. Yeah, so I'm going to get to it. <laughs> okay, well. Because it was perfect. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Bridget, but oh, you, no. did mention, you mentioned sleep mm -hmm. and um, our friend, Stephen, Stephen Kim, you know him, Charmaine. Yep. Um, Yay. He wanted to know, does sleep apnea also contribute to the kidney function deterioration? And Dr. Patel has a nice answer. I'm not going to read it. You say it, Dr. I, Patel. Yeah, I think, I think yes, it can. Um, and directly, not so much. Sleep apnea, sleep apnea is not a cause of kidney failure, but sleep apnea does cause high blood pressure. And if untreated, can cause damage to your kidneys, which again, mm -hmm. another reason why we need to check your blood pressure. And you know, we're going to work on a uh, webinar about um, sleep deprivation or, you know, losing sleep while you're on kidney, uh, while you have kidney disease. Um, I think all of us have had issues with that. I don't know, Paul, if you um, had insomnia or anything, but I had it for many years and, um, you know, I'm taking prednisone. So that's part of the reason, I, I guess, but we're going to do a whole show on that too. Um, That's a fascinating but, topic, by the way. If you have any uh, recommendations on who I should talk to about that, and if you'd like to join too. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> um, <No>. Also, <laughs> um, would you, Dr. Patel, would you explain what chronic kidney disease is versus end-stage kidney disease and the, the different so, stages? Yes, yeah, so there's, there's five stages, um, one, two, three, four, and five, and chronic kidney disease um, is based on that, remember that number, that EGFR, it's a percentage mm -hmm. of kidney function, and each stage has some cutoffs. So um, chronic kidney disease stage one is, you know, above 90%. Stage two is really that 60 to 90%. Um, stage three would be 30 to 60, and that is probably the most common um, level of kidney disease or common um, which I say diagnosis, and that is broken into two, which is chronic kidney disease stage three, which is 3A, um, 45 to 60, and 3B, 30 to 45. Stage four would be 15 to 30, and stage five is less than 15. So it's a spectrum of disease from one, two, three, four, and five, 
an end stage kidney disease is essentially when you are at a point in time, generally chronic kidney disease stage five, that your body cannot, your kidneys and your body cannot keep up with the demands on of, your, of what you're doing. And you have a lot of symptoms that cannot be managed by medications. And, and, at, that, and, and at that time, end stage kidney disease or ESKD, um, some people call it ESRD, end stage renal disease. At that point is when hopefully we have options in terms of renal replacement therapy or kidney rep kidney um, therapy, which would be really dialysis as well as transplantation. Mm -hmm. Who is at risk for kidney disease? Are, are there, you know, what are some of the risk factors? Yeah, so risk factors, I mean, in, in general speaking terms, anybody with family history of kidney disease will have a higher risk. Um, uncontrolled high blood pressure diabetes, higher risk. Smoking, higher risk. Um, as you get older, we do lose a little bit of kidney function, and, and really that's just age-related. So elder age can be considered a risk, although it's not necessarily a risk because everyone is getting older every second. Um, and so uh, what else? Yeah, those are the main risk factors. Um, anything that you do harmful to the body mm -hmm. can be a risk. Some antibiotics are... are very dangerous for the kidneys. I was speaking to someone today too, taking that had been taking ibuprofen for mm. many, many years. Um, that's a big subject. I think people need to know, you know, that's bad for your kidneys, peeps. Yeah. Ibuprofen. That was something that um, when I was younger, it was part of the, I don't know if it was high blood pressure or what. I got lots and lots of headaches before I was diagnosed with kidney disease. And so I used mm -hmm. to take you know, ibuprofen to mm -hmm. treat those. Um, I also always had like a weak stomach too. So it's like, how many of those things were little indicators long before I knew mm -hmm. what was happening? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, Paul, were you, um, were you very symptomatic when you were sick? Uh, while, you mean while I was undergoing dialysis? Yeah, I, or just well, before? I mean, uh, before it was mainly... It was mainly the uh, swelling of the legs. Yeah. Um, and then went on uh, different versions of chemotherapy to, to get it back into remission. Mm -hmm. um, but, but during dialysis, you know, as you guys were talking about the brain fog, that was totally me. I remember walking into Costco, you know, pushing the cart and I was right, right behind somebody. And I totally like ran over the person because I had no awareness. Lost. Yeah. I don't even know how I made it to Costco. But... <laughs> But it was, it was, it was a weighted blanket, as you said, Dr. Patel, just on my whole body. Yeah. Yeah. Weighted blanket is a good description. Yeah. So Cindy, when, when you speak with people, um, I know your, your position is really educator about different uh, modalities that are available. What are some of the um, things that you talk to patients about to, um, you tell them to help keep their kidneys healthy? Like what are some of the basics that you share? Um, yeah, I like to get to know my patients and get to know their lifestyle. You know, I like to have a very personal conversation if time permits. That way I, it's more beneficial to the patient and helping them and treating them because everybody has like their own perspective and their own um, routines, right? Some people mm -hmm. can walk, but they need a walker. Well, let's talk about exercise. Well, how are we going to use that walker? Let's take, ten, you know, let's walk with our walker for five minutes. Let's just make some improvements there. Um, or somebody that has a stationary bike and that hasn't used it. And okay, let's start 10 minutes. You know, let's just start building some momentum, some stamina, you know, because exercise mm -hmm. is so critical or even just walking. Mm -hmm. um, and baby steps, because if you try to deliver so much up front, you know, it's overwhelming and it's not sustainable. Right. So if you just make little markers and baby steps, you know, let's do five minutes here. Let's cut out maybe a little bit of alcohol here. You know, let's just make it moderation and that's not take it all away. <laughs> Right? right. And let's find out what other routines and habits are they doing through the day where we can make some new interventions and say, hey, did you know that might be another problem to your kidney care, your mm -hmm. kidney health? Um, 
And then we also talk about medication compliance. That's a really big one. Mm -hmm. Um, Patients just for some reason have this idea that if they skip a few days of their medication, they're okay, right? Well, eventually that's going to catch up. Um, And that's not all right. So I, you know, I have to really gauge. I, ha- I would, I love to get to know my patients because that way I feel like I'm making a difference for them. I can really help them individually. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, medication compliance, exercise, diet, weight management, stress levels. Um, yeah, I mean, and and even just over-the-counter medications too. Like we were Mm kind of touching on a little bit. What are you taking? How much are you taking? Um, Is that just expensive urine? You know, let's cut back on maybe a few supplements here, you know, because there's so much information about supplements, 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 supplements. And Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of that, you get a lot of it in your diet. If you eat a balanced diet, I think. Um, But yeah, that's kind of what I touch on a little bit. Nice. Thank you. I think that's important. Sure. It is it is overwhelming because you're yeah. under, you know, mm-hmm. you're hit with the kidney disease sledgehammer. And now you have to for me it was now I have to and I was I always ate relatively healthy, but now it's limit your phosphorus, limit your potassium. You know, sodium made sense to me. Um, and then also limit your protein. And so when you go and look at the labels, you, you realize everything has protein. Mm-hmm. And then your your mind just goes in a whirlwind. So mm-hmm. I, I agree, Cindy, at the you know, mm-hmm. the, the overwhelmingness and it's a lot. In the beginning is, is a yeah. Lot. Yeah. It's a lifestyle change for sure. For sure. Um, I feel like if we continue to follow a healthy, you know, diet, a lot of people are saying plant-based diet, and we'll be talking about that at some point, but um, that that's really great for people with kidney disease. So what do you think about that, Dr. Patel, about a plant-based diet? Yeah, no, I think, um, what the way I explain it is, you know, when we were cavemen and women back in the day, um, before we learned how to hunt, it was to eat plants. And that's kind of what our kidneys are able to handle the best. And especially when it comes down to protein, um, protein um, digested is easier to handle for the kidney than animal. So animal protein is a little bit harder. Not that we cannot do it, but um, the markers in the blood that we use um, that are, that can cause the symptoms we've all discussed, uh, a lot of them come from animal protein. And so we can help prevent kidney disease or prevent prevention, prevention of kidney disease by what you're discussing in the diet. So salt intake raises blood pressure, um, pl- uh, excess of protein from an animal source can make your kidneys have to filter more to then do more work and potentially cause that Um, toxin level to go up. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I'm all for plant-based diet. Um, I've kind of shifted myself over the last two years to more plant-based. And and I think one of the things that you guys have touched upon is the lifestyle you're talking about with Cindy, when you're educating patients, you're coming at it as, Hey, you don't, you're not coming at it as, as like uh, Paul, you said, the sludge hammer of kidney, um, you know, problems you're coming at is let's figure out what you're doing in your life and see where we can mm-hmm. make small changes, right. small changes over time, add up to a big change, but absolutely really be able to get a feel of who the patient, who the person is to then mm-hmm. help them in their, in their story, in their right. journey. And, and, and everyone's different because mm-hmm. it's funny. You talk about protein um, when you have a lot of protein in the urine, Paul or um, Bridget, and that's causing the swelling. Um, we will say, yeah, limit your protein. But then as soon as you turn over to dialysis, everyone talks about how you should eat a lot more protein. And it's, it's, it's complex for physicians. It's complex for healthcare providers, nurses, and dietitian. And then to be a patient that has that weighted blanket or that dark cloud above them at all times, how are they going to understand what you're talking about? And so mm-hmm. it, it really is, a, you know, Cindy, what you're doing by the lifestyle and everyone else educating on just these tidbits are so impactful. Mm-hmm. For everyone. It's definitely a science. Sorry, that was a long, that was a long yeah, answer. no, that's good. No, that was great. It needs <laughs> I, to be good emphasis in that because it is, it's a science. I do mm-hmm. want to touch base on, you know, the basics of dialysis. Can Dr. Patel, can you kind of go over 
kind of in a nutshell how dialysis works and how you know it affects the body. Sure. So the easiest way to explain it, um, there's two types of dialysis. Two types of dialysis. There's dialysis by the blood, where you have a direct communication to filter the blood. And then there's dialysis through the membrane of your stomach called the peritoneum. And that's peritoneal dialysis. So you have hemodialysis on one side, which is hemo blood, hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis on the other. There's some nuances about where you can do, whether it's in a center, at home, things like that. But in specifics for dialysis, our kidney, as we've talked about, is a filter. And so we need something when it's hemodialysis, we need to create a filter because we're taking blood out of the body and filtering it and then giving that blood back. And that filter has been man-made and it's you know exponentially grown in terms of how technology has moved to 2022 so that we can do as close of a job to the kidney as we can with these filters. Um, peritoneal dialysis is similar but we're using your own stomach lining. And that's a little different because everyone has a different body composition. And so some of that is learning the body over time to understand how much dialysis can occur via, via the peritoneum. Mm -hmm. peritoneum di peritoneal dialysis is where we take fluid in, put it into the belly around the peritoneum cavity. So it's not in the stomach. We often say through your stomach, but it's in through the abdominal cavity it sits there for some period of time and then gets drained out. And that process typically happens overnight, but it can happen at any time of the day. And through the process of fluid going in, sitting in the belly, and then coming out, we are actually clearing the toxins and filtering the, the blood. Which is, you know, comes back to lifestyle, which choice that a patient decides upon as far as their treatment is concerned. Um, for me, I, I chose peritoneal dialysis. I never thought I would because I didn't know what it was. I was really in the dark about it, but I was very active. I traveled. I continued to work. Um, it was just the right choice for me. And everyone has their own reasons. Um, Paul, do you want to share about, I know you've had experience with, I'm sorry, you said it earlier, but a little bit with both, right? No, it was just it hemo. Was just hemo. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, for me, for me at the time, I had the perception that the, you know, peritoneal dialysis, you know, I would have this huge stack of equipment in my room. Um, I don't know. I was, I was young and it was just the, the appearance of, of all that sickness at home. Mm -hmm. For me mentally, it was just easier to go into going, go into the office and have it done. Right. Um, but I mean, to be honest, thinking back, if, if I ever were to go through dialysis again, I, I would think I would really consider peritoneal this time. Cause it mm -hmm. just, I'm a little bit smarter on it and it, it sounds like it may be better for my life right now. Mm -hmm. How about you, Bridget? Um, yeah. So before my first transplant, I just did hemodialysis cause no one had told me about PD peritoneal dialysis. Mm -hmm. um, but after that transplant failed from the recurrence of my FSGS, um, they gave me the option for PD. So I did that and that was really great. I really liked it. And then once my second transplant failed due to recurrence again, I knew I wanted to go on to PD right away from my prior experience. So I did that and it helped me. I did that for nine years. I was able to finish up college and get my degree and I was able to work and then I worked full time. Um, it just came down to a point when I got um, peritonitis, which is an infection yeah. within the peritoneum. Um, it was never really quite identified what the actual like bug was. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't really treated correctly. And I ended up getting um, pretty intense scarring within my peritoneum. So I can't do that anymore. Um, it was just a lot of stress on my life yeah. and on my body and I got really sick. So since then I've switched back to in center and uh, that's been great for me, but mm -hmm. I also, you know, I stopped working and did other things too. So mm -hmm. it, my lifestyle completely shifted with right. the dialysis um, right. reality that I was getting. And mm -hmm. so it right. worked for me now to do in center. Right. But before when I wanted to do both, PD was a great option. And like he said, mm -hmm. I 
traveled a lot and I was able to work and work around my mm-hmm. schedule. Um, but as Paul said, it's, it was a ton of stuff. It's yeah, a lot of boxes, boxes and boxes, boxes yep. and boxes and boxes of stuff. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. You definitely like have to have the space. And as he was saying, not wanting to see his illness at home, mm-hmm. like I want to go and get it done and do it. And that's kind of at a spot I am now, you know, I'm mm-hmm. um, debating moving to home hemodialysis. And it's again, mm. it's a mind shift because yeah. you have going in the center is kind of nice. You just show up and somebody else does all the work for you. You leave and I don't have to think about it until I Mm -hmm. show up again. Whereas when you're in charge and you do it at home, you think about it kind of all the time. It has a lot of, you know, there's always pros and cons, but it's definitely, there's a large mind shift. And so depending Mm -hmm. on what you want your lifestyle to be, how you want to deal with it. You know, I knew some people at one point, I was talking to this gentleman and he was younger, like he seemed to be able to take care of himself and he could have been a great candidate for peritoneal dialysis, but he was concerned about having um, a catheter and having young children and wanting to do stuff and play and have them climb on him and all the different things. So, you know, for each person, there's a million different reasons why you choose the different modalities and it's really helpful. Right. We have a couple of options right Mm -hmm. now. Thank you. Thank you for that. Hey, I, you know, I want to ask it because we're getting close to the time, but Dr. Patel and Cindy, how do you think kidney care has changed within the last 20 years? Um, like patient care, blood pressure management, diabetes management, how, whoever wants to go first. Go ahead, Cindy. Dum-da-da-dum-dum. Jeez, a lot. I mean, I think people are more, there's a new awareness, right? Mm -hmm. So that awareness is very helpful. I mean, it's on the TV now. There's kidney care, uh, kidney care commercials now. Um, I think people are more in tune with diet now than there used to be. Mm -hmm. Um, There are people are more in tune about exercise. You know, back in the day, there was aerobics and jazzercise. And they're like, what are you doing? Why are you moving around? Right (laughs) now, it's just it's mandatory. Um, Mm -hmm. So that all plays into, I think, the new idea of the kidney disease and technology has come so far with kidney disease and kidney management and the landscape of medicine is different now. Um, You know, there's ways of helping our patients on such a, I think, uh, faster platforms now we can really improve, we've improved our care because of the new technology platforms. And I think our nephrologists now know so much more today than they knew 20 years ago. And, you know, dialysis keeps changing and keeps improving and the machines and the technology and the cartridges and the numbers and the accuracies about knowing about the patient um, and their history. So I know that's a long answer, but there, <laughs> it, there's been drastic improvements and um, I don't know, that's my answer. Sorry, it's a little long. No, I think that's great. Um, you know, and while, while you're getting ready to answer this, Dr. Patel, I'm going to um, share some information about just some educational resources uh, people may not have thought of, but so please go ahead and chat while I share. <laughs> Did share my screen almost. I didn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it. Okay, Dr. Patel, now your turn. Yeah, so I think Cindy spot on. I think information is in our pockets with our phones. Um, and those phones can now, you know, do more things than in the health space than they used to be able to. You can have your heart rate checked with an, with an Apple Watch. You can, you know, go, it wasn't just that you had to go to CVS or the local drugstore to get your blood pressure checked now. People are okay doing it at home. So there's just more general awareness. Um, and, and really the, the biggest thing with that information, it comes with some positive and negative for the physician. Um, we have deeper conversations. Mm-hmm. People are engaged in their own self. And there's always going to be patients that are or people that aren't engaged in their own health. 
But when you do have that engaged person with their health, like I check my blood pressure, I'm doing this. Why is this happening? It, mm -hmm. it really makes a more deeper visit and that visit helps them, mm -hmm. you know, and it, and it also helps me as a provider that, oh, wow, like I enjoy this. I, I this is why I went into it. So um, with the technology comes some heartache, but um, I think just the exposure to the knowledge and getting getting awareness out mm -hmm. is is really helpful because again Great. it is that silent killer. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, I I do have two questions, and I'm I did want to mention the educational resources, American Association of Kidney Patients. The great information on community activities, patient education ad advocacy efforts, the dialysis patient citizens um, dot org, great site too. Um, information on the basics of kidney disease, kidney education, um, and then of course the OG National Kidney Foundation kidney dot org. Um, you know we have two questions here. See, Janine. I'm stage three at 35%. I'm getting my legs and arms are hurting so bad. Is this normal? Do you think, Janine, that that was happening before? And most likely the answer is no. And so, yeah, that is not normal. And so mm -hmm. the question is, where is it coming from? It may not mm -hmm. necessarily be related to the kidney. Maybe it's something else. But um, not treating you or talking about this in, in the exact patient scenario or case scenario, um, when your kidney function is getting lower, um, that can cause changes in the, in the way your bone health is. So calcium and phosphorus metabolism can change, and that may be what you're experiencing. Again, I can't tell you exactly, um, right. but, but that is something to think about. Please see your physician, Janine. Um, yeah. Thank you for answering that, Dr. Patel. So, um, one more, let's see. Oh, is there part of Stevens that I didn't get here? This might be something you could help with, uh, Cindy. I don't know if you see that. A person in kidney transplant evaluation process mentioned to get on multiple locations to get on their waiting list for transplant. Does Medicare cover multiple location listings? I'm not sure. Yeah, you know I don't what? know. That's a good I know, question. I know, I know who can answer that for you, and he's yeah. not here today. Mm -hmm. um, Stephen, I... I I would like Go to ahead. say that that just um, from knowledge that I have is that um, Medicare does cover um, because it's it's you know government insurance right it's Medicare so it is like every place accepts Medicare um, as far as transplant um, the thing that that's that you have to look at is that is that Medicare only covers eighty percent and so the, so usually transplant patients um, centers dialysis places will want you to have um, some type of secondary mm -hmm. um, coverage. So, mm -hmm. and preferably not Medicaid, uh, preferably like a supplemental plan or something like that. Um, there's also now that legislation passed, it's been a couple of years now, but for, for the kidney community that Medicare Advantage plans are available to us um, as kidney patients during open enrollment, mm -hmm. um, which is really awesome, um, but not every transplant center accepts all Medicare Advantage plans. So um, for um, other issues with that, like I'm a Kaiser patient and uh, I cannot have Medicare Advantage with Kaiser. Right, yeah. because you have because you have senior advantage as your Medicare Advantage plan. Well, right? um, it's not because of that. I can't do it at Kaiser because I started dialysis prior to being a Kaiser patient. Kaiser, okay, yeah. So they won't let you do managed care. So I have, you know, A, B. Got it, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I also have Medicaid, but yeah, because yeah, I do know you have to be fully covered, not just Medicare, you have to have a Medicare right. plan as yeah. well. And I think that, yeah, you can be listed at multiple clinics. Multiple, mm -hmm. You can definitely yeah, just, be listed. I, yeah. You have to be in different areas though. Yeah, I, like I would I can't do one across town because it's not going to make a difference. It has to be like, right. I would recommend that um, that if you want to go to like, um, like, for example, in Michigan, a lot of people will um, will also list in Toledo um, in Illinois. They'll list in St. Louis, you know, so things like that. Yeah, but, like, but it's just that to contact that transplant center or, you know, somebody at the clinic to contact that transplant center to find out what plan they accept. That's the yeah. best route to go. Yeah.
Yeah, Thank I was going to say you can definitely be listed everywhere. One of the stipulations is if they if we call you, are you going to be able to get here? Yeah. So if you're in yeah. New York and you're mm -hmm. listed in LA, if you don't get there in time, it doesn't really help you. And so yeah. that's one aspect of it. The second aspect, um, not necessarily insurance wise, but as you're saying, you know, there's the UNOS or the United Nations or uh, the, the sharing network of organs. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. every area, every geographical area has a donor pool of kidneys. Yes. So you, mm -hmm. you want to try to be outside of donor pools instead exactly. of, exactly. you know, if you're, mm -hmm. if you're just across yeah. the street, as you say, you're, you're in the same pool of kidneys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another but, one of the stipulations, um, like you mentioned, doctor, in regards to you have to get there in time to get the kidney, um, is they want you to be able to be in that location for your aftercare as yeah. well for up to yeah. a certain amount of time. That's you a good point. Don't let, we'll give you a kidney and then you go back to LA and have different doctors. You know, they want to be able to care for you. Yeah. Immediately locally for a little yeah. while. So that's part of it as well. Regarding Bridget, I forgot about Kaiser. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> that website that Dr. Patel mentioned is unos, U -N -O -S org for more information yeah. on that. Um, you know, we're coming to a close here, and be but before we do, I'd like to ask our panelists, what is one thing you'd like to leave the kidney community with for National Kidney Month? So is there something you'd like people to take away from our conversation today? Um, and I think I would like to choose... Charmaine, you made that face. So Charmaine, go ahead and yeah. go. <laughs> um, so I guess I guess I just wanted to throw it out there that you know, starting, you know, if you're starting to have experienced kidney problems, or even if you're still on, you know, already on dialysis and whatnot, whatever stage you're at, um, you know, this is very cliche, but truly you're not you're not alone anymore. You know, when I when I was going through my dialysis um 20 something years ago you know, there was nothing out there really um, that um, that was local and that, you know, that that provided this type of um, this type of service. So it really is amazing. Um, so just remember that, that you're not alone. If you have questions, just ask, you know, um, if you don't think something is right, it's probably not right. Mm -hmm. So um, so just ask. And I'm, I'm a huge proponent of ask, ask, ask <laughs> if you ask and the doctors explain something to you and you don't understand it, ask again and just keep asking until, until you understand it because mm -hmm. it's your body. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cindy, how about you? Yeah. Um, I think the biggest thing I think that some patients really uh, agree with is because this is such a journey and um, we are taking a lot of steps and there is a lot of information. So get ready and get a journal, get something where you can start charting and mm -hmm. your own life and your own questions and the, your own answers to those questions. Mm -hmm. So you can start organizing your own care, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to take that because we get in front of a doctor and we get nervous and our blood pressure, you know, oh my God, what are my labs going to look like? What is he going to tell me? Mm -hmm. You know, and we get anxious. So it's hard to receive that information when you're mm -hmm. anxious, right? So you calm down, take your journal, take your questions, begin to write those things down. I think it's a better way to use that tool to manage your care. Thank you. I'm just nervous having Dr. Patel here right now. <laughs> this is my first webinar. I was super nervous. I yeah. know. Let's give him a hand first. First Yay. webinar for Dr. Patel. Thank you for choosing right. Reman to be your first one. Um, Paul, do you have some takeaways you'd like to share? Mine is, mine is in line with, with the last two uh, regarding education. So mm -hmm. that, you know, your doctor's only going to tell you so much. They'll, they'll probably tell you a lot, but but you're really the only person that cares about your health and, and your life. So at the end of the day, nobody cares about you more than you. So, you know, my, my word of advice is, is be educated, read up, learn how the kidney functions on your own. Um, and then you'll be more educated to ask your doctor questions. Mm -hmm. Nice. Bridget. Thanks, Paul. Bridget, how about you? Um, I mean, I'm going to piggyback on all these people as well. Like, uh, you are your own self-advocate. If something seems funny, if you're feeling just off, get it checked out, talk to a mm -hmm. doctor, 
and see what it is. It could be nothing. It could be something that's a really easy fix, or it could be a small sign to a bigger silent disease that you right. wouldn't have caught until it's right. late. And you want to be able to catch these things because there's so many things now, like we've talked about the advancements, mm-hmm. a lot you can do now to stop the right. issue from progressing. Right. So, Thank advocate you. For yourself. Yep. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And Dr. Patel. I think um, everybody here has their own personal journey and everyone has so much to offer. And so when you're not able to do it yourself for whatever reason, whether it's you're not able to understand, whether it's you don't have someone, exactly what every single person said, you're not alone, ask questions. If you can be your own self-advocate, find someone who can and Remend is a great place for that and come prepared, written stuff, writing stuff down. And the most important is find a physician that cares about you as well, because you want to, and when I meet, what I mean by that is get that relationship because it all starts with trust in a relationship with the physician. And if you have that, you can go through what everyone else on this call has gone through. Cause I think that probably was one of the big things for each of us is we had someone that would help us if it wasn't ourselves, but then on the other side of being a patient and seeing from there that, you know, my physician answers my questions. He gives me, he or she gives me the time. And Mm -hmm. that's what I say to my patients. I see most of them 15, 20 minutes every few months. But if they decide that that day is the day they want to give me more questions, I stay long enough. And I don't think about, oh man, I have too many patients after because I think, well, this is my, they're telling me this is my opportunity to learn. And I, if I educate them enough, then they can leave the room being, knowing that they can take care of themselves when they're not Mm -hmm. in the room. Cause I'm not with everyone. I'm not, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's wonderful to hear. Yeah, Yeah, isn't it? So many are not like that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Patel. Um, You know, thank you all for for sharing today and for being here. I, I know, I know this information can be overwhelming, but we hope it encourages you to focus on your self care and become your own advocate. Ask questions at your doctor appointments, just like we're all saying. Um, Bring someone with you, record the visit on your phone. That's what I do on occasion. Uh, Keep notes. Um, So if you or someone you know is dealing with kidney disease and would like to speak to someone who's been on their own kidney journey, please reach out to Remend. Our website address is remend.org. And you can see how you can be involved by donating or even becoming a mentor or check out our previous broadcast on remend.org. Kidney disease is not a single person disease. It really involves the whole family. Um, So, and and, you know, there are millions of people in the United States who are affected by kidney disease. And it's important to know, just like Charmaine said, you're not alone. So uh, I do want to invite everyone uh, to our next discussion. Next month, we're going to talk all about peritoneal dialysis. Um, And we touched on it a little bit today but um, there's so much more to discuss. And getting ready to close everything out here. We hope you can join us next month, Um, but I also want to thank our amazing panelists for participating. Thank you guys so much. And I want to thank all of our viewers for taking the time to educate themselves about kidney health and kidney care. And hopefully we'll see you at the next one. So peace out. Thank you guys. Good to see you. Thank you so much for being here. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you.